Barry and Jenny, I am so excited to sit down with both of you. Um, you know, when we came up with this idea, we asked Mary to pick any any book in the world. It could be fiction, it could be sci-fi, it could be biography, anything she wanted. And Mary, you picked Ginny's book, Good Power. Um, so to kick off the conversation, why was that the book you chose? What did it say to you that you wanted to talk about today? Well, first of all, I think there's so many aspects of the book that are really important. And Ginny's been such an important person in my life. Um, when I took the CEO role, um, she, she didn't know, we didn't know each other. And I got this wonderful call saying, hey, um, as a fellow uh, CEO, uh, I'm here to help if there's anything you can do. And that started a friendship that I now consider Ginny to be one of my dearest friends. So as I had the opportunity to read the book, I think, first of all, you learn what a special person Ginny is, but then her advice is so sound of, of really what, how uh, leaders can use their power to really change the world. And so um, it was just something that uh, had an impact on me and I wanted to share. Well, thank you for doing so. And and Jenny, you said previously you didn't set out to write a book initially. You didn't keep a journal. You didn't save your papers. Um, but you have quite the life story from growing up in the outskirts of Chicago, helping your mom raise your siblings. Uh, when your dad left, you found your way to Northwestern and um, an entry-level job at IBM in 81, ultimately to rise to become the company's ninth CEO in 2012. I'm curious, what encouraged you to share this journey? Yeah. Well, well, first I have to thank Mary for picking me. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, so she talks about how meaningful I've been to her and she to me. And I think you'll just find in this conversation, um, to me, Mary exemplifies what the book's about, because it's about how to do hard things, but do them in a good way, which, you know, particularly post this weekend and what has happened in the discussion about rhetoric and how to resolve differences. Um, to me, Mary's a great role model of that. And uh, so if you let me start there, then I'll answer your question. Yeah. Um, but that I always tell Mary, she is one of the most authentic leaders I've ever met. And if I had to pick one word, I always tell everyone that's my word for Mary. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll see that in this, I think even in our chat today. So that's how you describe her in mutual. the book. <laughs> it is how I describe her in the yeah. book. And so it is a very much mutual. I have learned so much from her too. And, um, and so when you say why, so why did I end up really writing a book. And I, and I have to say a little of it is serendipity, but, but the other part was so many people kept saying to me what you just said, there's so few people that have had your background mm -hmm. at, that knew me that said, you have this background and we're in tech and as a woman in tech and that, you know, would you please write it? And I struggled with that for a long time. And then I finally convinced myself that I could write it if I could actually help people. And you were asking me about how long it took to write. And part of that was because I got so much feedback from people because I really didn't want to write something if people didn't felt they could learn something from it. So that took a lot of rewriting to get it to be in a way that, you know, you could not tell people something, you could actually show them something. And that's a really vulnerable thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that took me some getting used to. And uh, so in the end, I decided there was, when I say serendipity, a little bit of timing that this was the moment to talk about doing tough stuff, but doing it in a really positive way. Because kind of the tenets of the book are, if you would just love tension and conflict, but do it respectfully, mm -hmm. and then be willing to celebrate progress, not perfection. And I think that kind of fits the moment we're in. Yeah, I think that perfectly encapsulates what you were writing about. Um, and you mentioned, of course, the events over the weekend, which I know is likely top of mind for many of our viewers, both here in studio and then over Zoom. You talk about your experience in the book with uh, then President Donald Trump and the, you know, the conflict um, you faced in whether or not to to join and, and advise him. And ultimately, you decided that it was, you know, progress over party. Yes. And you you decided to advise him, and then ultimately took a step back after Charlottesville. And I'm curious as you look at kind of just the the division in society today and what's going on on the political level and the events of this weekend, how are you thinking about just speaking out and a CEO's role? I know it's something that you tackled in the book as well. Yeah, well, I, I think we both, and Mary obviously okay. still in her role feels that every day, mm -hmm. um, but I felt really strongly that it was my role to talk about policies, mm -hmm. not politics. 
and, and I think that's an easy thing to say, but you really can live by that. Um, but it doesn't mean you can talk about everything. So I do think it is a CEO's role to speak out, but you got to pick the things that are important to you. And to me, the things at, at the time when I was leading IBM, it was anything that had to do with trust in the company. It had to do with inclusion and it had to do with preparing the next generation to love technology. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I, I had that conversation with the workforce that these are the things I will speak out on. And I should mention one other, and I think this is where we both share, or if it was an affront to our values, right? And and that to me makes it quite easy usually to understand when to speak out, right? If if it's in accordance with your value and you understand what your values are, right? And so, and that's why I think, but I hope now, which out of a horrible tragedy, I hope it's a reset and that people really take this moment to say, look, it's okay to have divisions. Um, and I talk about that a lot, love conflict, but how you handle it is really an important piece of how you lead. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, again, if I can say to Mary, I think she has a great role model. The kind of the subcurrent of the book is how you lead is more important than maybe what you do. Mm -hmm. And I always found Mary is such a great example of how she leads, right? Because when you started your position, you had quite some tragedies to deal with mm -hmm. and some challenges to deal with. But I always think, I can't remember your exact quote, something like, you know, the best deal time to deal with a problem is like as soon as you know it, right? Exactly, exactly. And and I think of what what Mary has had dealt with at that time. You have to remind me, it was a transition. It, it, it? Uh, it was an ignition switch. Ignition recall. switch, right. that's what it right. was at the time. But it, having to deal with, and there were some serious issues around it, I mean, mm -hmm. just tackled it head on and dealt with culture of the company head on, right? And so that's why I hope this moment is a, that kind of catalyst that people say, "Why right, step back. This is this is a wonderful country, but now let's, fine, you, we can debate policies, let's debate them, right? But let's do it with respect. And Mary, what's your take kind of of the events of the weekend and, and how to lead through times like these? Well, first, I mean, it, it's just tragic. And I mean, it shook me to my core. I was literally, you know, as we all are on our phone going, I can't believe this. It's like, no, this can't be right. This is, this can't be happening. And, you know, I'm grateful that President Trump is okay. It's, it's really tragic that someone lost their life. Uh, and this, and, you know, like Ginny, uh, where I, somehow we've lost the ability to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have 10 people in a room, you're going to have 10 different points of view and that's good. So much of business is when people bring their different perspectives, you can make better decisions. But, and if there, and there are going to be things we all don't agree about, that's okay. And we should respect those differences as opposed to right now, it's just, you know, it's, it's worrisome to me. And so again, I'm glad uh, the president is okay. And I'm, you know, I feel so, um, just so sad for the family that uh, lost lost one of the members of their family. And I hope this can be a lesson for everyone if we need to move on. And and again, it's it's about the policies. It's not about violence. Yeah. There, and there are countless business examples about how leading through consensus and just everybody being a, a yes person doesn't ever get to the best outcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, that there's scientific studies that that say that. And that's the the base case for supporting diversity so that you get that diversity of thought. Um, Mary, I want to go into your background as well, because like Jenny, you started at an entry level job at GM um, in a stamping plant and then a quality inspector on the assembly line. And you also worked your way up. Um, you said in your Duke commencement address a few years ago that your experience on the assembly line taught you empathy, noting it's foundational to any form of leadership. And that reminded me of Ginny's first principle of the book, to be in service of. And so how do you think about making power good? And how did reading Ginny's book kind of reshape your thinking about just the role of leadership and the role of good power? Well, I think uh, from at, at its very core, one of the things uh, to me was the fact that a lot of times when people talk about power, use the word, it's, it's always like in a negative con connotation. So the fact that, yes, if you can use power to advance advance the the country advance the world from a technology perspective but also i think what makes uh jenny's book so special and as you read it you know how much she's done to give people opportunity 
uh, with uh, what she's done and you know, really creating a new category of new collar jobs and what the work she's doing on 110 right now, uh, because it, it really is a skills-based versus credentials-based path that is so powerful. And we were one of the, the founding members of 110 that she uh, leads or co-leads with Ken and Ken. Yep. And uh, it, you know, we, again, we think it's, it's a really important pathway because fundamentally I believe, you know, with what we've been talking about and uh, the fact that there's inequities, uh, I think education is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. If everyone, I was fortunate to get a great education because uh, I came from a very humble background. Um, I, I always attribute my mother of, she believed in the American dream and that if you worked hard, you could do anything. And I think that's embodied in what is in, in Jenny's book about good power and working hard and lifting people. And so um, that that's, I, I, I thought she just discussed it and framed it so well. Yeah, and one of the things that struck me, Jenny, in that part of the book was when you talked about the statistic that had the impact on you being that nearly all of those who die from deaths of despair, as you call it, um, they don't have a four-year degree. Right. And so you have devoted a tremendous amount of passion um, toward a skills first world, people being hired and promoted based on skills and knowledge and not their educational background. Where do you think society is in kind of shifting that bias away from the four-year degree um, and toward more of a, a skills and credential first mentality? Do you think that we have made significant progress? Well, I, I definitely think we have made significant progress, right? And I, and I think it's gone from a concept to, I mean, I hope, I mean, what I've dedicated myself to is making it a movement and, and not just in this country, it's really across the world. Because honestly, I don't, I think it's actually the thing most important to democracy because mm. if people think they have a better way forward, then they embrace democracy. I saw a horrible survey the other day that said, um, actually it was Bruce Melman, one of his newsletters that put out that he said that um, if you look at the youngest generation, only 40% think America and capitalism is a good thing. If you look at our generation, that would be a very different number. Mm. And to me, that's a frightening thought. And I think for people to think that they have a good way forward means they have to have a good paying job. And that's typically, you know, mm -hmm. one of the bars for it. And, you know, when I got into this work and I was just so, I don't know what I thought. I was so startled. And I remember way back in time when we were all shaped by our experiences, but to learn that 65% of Americans don't have a college degree. I don't know what I thought. And then I thought, well, maybe other countries they do. Mm -hmm. Nope. 65% don't in almost all developed countries, right? And then 80% of black Americans don't. Those are startling numbers, right? And when you see them, you don't wonder, you shouldn't wonder why there's unrest, right? When people think, gee, I'm not gonna do better than my past generation. And and if I can just a little longer answer to your question, yeah. I am shaped by my, my history, like you saw in the book, right? Because when we're all a product of a journey we're on and when my dad, left my mom and left our family, right? And as I talk about it, I witnessed it. He didn't know I was there. And he said to my mother, who at the time is 32 years old with four children, I don't care about you. I don't care about any of you. And he left. Well, my mom had never worked outside the home a day and she only had a high school degree. And that would form in my mind. I watched what she did, right? Never cried, was never a victim. She got a little bit of education, never got a degree, but enough to eventually get a decent job, right? To take us off of welfare and food stamps. And it formed in my mind this really firm opinion that access and aptitude were two different things mm -hmm. for people. Meaning that, hey, my mom was really quite bright, but she had no access. You know, exactly. we talk about what we got to have educations. And I thought this idea is applies to so many people. And then I would fast forward, you know, my tenure, well before um, all the focus now on skills first, it would be, as I say, another serendipity moment. I'm working on cyber skills when they didn't exist yet. I mean, now we talk about it freely, but 2012, they didn't. And um, long story short, we start working with some underprivileged high schools and we start working with kids that are not gonna go to college and we give them jobs in this area and a little mentorship, work with a community college. And lo and behold, they're like hugely successful mm. and they go on to get degrees. And it would form in my mind, just like my mom, like me, like Mary, like where you start shouldn't determine where you end. Right. So I'm, I'm, it's very visceral to me that I could see this and I would go on and study it. And then I would see that because, you know, my workforce too felt don't dumb down the workforce. hundred percent of us have PhDs and degrees, but what we found, we studied it. 
all these folks did just as well as the degreed folks. They actually took more education. They were more retentive, more loyal. I'm thinking, now what is bad about this equation? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good equation. It's a new talent pool, right? And it would convince me, like with AI now, everybody's got to get a new skill. So this isn't just about people who don't have college degrees, right, to hire for skills. And so, like I say, a little long answer to the why now do I think it's moving? I think it's moving now for the right reasons. I think originally people thought of it as corporate social responsibility work. Start a little. I know Mary does not feel that way. Then time went on and where we got sort of another boost in attention was for um, when George Floyd was murdered. Mm -hmm. And then people associated economic opportunity as an answer to racism, which it can be. But I think now everyone's seeing, like I said, with AI, that they're like, hey, wait, we are all going to have to change skills, right? And so it's a, it's a talent strategy and an access to a new pool of talent you've never had. So I feel Mary's in 110. They were one of the first people to sign up. It's to place a million Black Americans without degrees in upwardly mobile middle-class jobs. Mary was one of the first ones to uh, sign up and has stuck with it and been a role model. And you I talk about like you looked at the engineering areas, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. About what it took to lead to get people to start to believe that people who had a different starting spot would well, do well. Exactly. And it is something um, you have to really go in and look at your job descriptions when you're looking to hire and say, you know, what, what do I need this person? What skills do they need as opposed to what, they, what degree that they have? And really going through and rewriting those. And, and, and Jenny, because uh, IBM had been down this path, when, when we did that, we really just saw there were a lot of places we could bring in very skilled people mm -hmm. that were going to add a tremendous amount of value. And then at, from a General Motors perspective, we already have a lot of people who are a part of the company who do incredibly important will, work in our company, uh, building our vehicles, our powertrains, our mo battery modules. And uh, you know, I grew up in manufacturing, so the amount of respect I have for the individuals uh, that you know have it have a, a wonderful skill, but don't necessarily have a four-year degree, I think it was important for, for everyone to start to recognize that. And then the great thing at General Motors is once you join the company, we have both education uh, that's toward a degree. If you want to, uh, yeah. we support somebody earning a degree, as well as if you just want to keep getting certifications and getting new skills, uh, we provide that. So I feel like once we someone joins the company and we give them that opportunity, it, it really is, is, you know, it gives them the opportunity to go as far as they want to go. Mm. So uh, I think, and again, as I said, I think education is so important because I think it can be what really uplifts everyone. Well, you know, you look, Mary and I have this in kind of, I was running the business roundtables workforce education when I retired. Mary yes. took it over. So yeah. we both have this. I feel like you have these parallel paths about, we, in we, life. We did. Did. I worked for General Motors before I worked for yes. IBM. Yes. Right? Yeah, we didn't for know. A yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Uh, for a moment. But, yes. I was no good at cars. Oh, yes. no. Yeah. Well, but I, I thought that when I was reading the book that your lives are so in sync and so parallel. I look forward to Mary's book in a few years. Yeah, uh, and we too. can maybe sit down and do this again. Um, but you, you speak about kind of leading through change as well. And I know, Jenny, when you were at the helm, um, it was cloud, it was AI. And now Mary, you have these very ambitious goals toward mm -hmm. electric vehicles. Right. Um, One million produced by next year, um, and then a full electric fleet in, I believe it's 2036? 2035. 2035. Um, so how do you analogize kind of what you're overseeing to what Ginny talked about in the book in terms of taking these, I mean, I think you have 229 years of you know, between IBM and GM as companies, you've got these old companies, these old giant companies that you're pivoting. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about kind of leading through change and especially in, you know, compared to what Ginny went through with, with AI and cloud? Well, I think almost every industry, every company is going through some type of transformation because of technology and now AI is accelerating for everyone. You know, at General Motors moving to uh, an all-electric future and almost what's more important is the fact that the vehicle really is a software platform. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown right now. We won't, you know, uh, we, we won't get to a million just because the market's not developing, but it will, we'll get there. And so we're going to be guided by the customer, uh, but, uh, what I like to tell people is 
get in that electric vehicle and drive it. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's instant torque. It opens up new design language for the vehicle. So as the charging infrastructure gets more robust, as EVs become more affordable, I definitely think we're going to see that growth. Uh, and the next 10, 11, 12 years is going to be pretty uh, pretty transformative in the way people move. Uh, but it is, it's, it's, it's very important about skills because, you know, training our workforce to do uh, build an internal combustion engine vehicle versus an electric, there's different skills that you need. So again, we've been doing a lot of that training in-house to make sure people are ready uh, when we start at each plant, when we start building electric vehicles. So if, again, the, the educational piece, and Ginny said it well, the transform, the technology that is transforming every industry. If you think your industry is not being transformed, you should be afraid because you're missing it. Uh, and so the new skills we're all going to have to not only learn ourselves, but make sure our workforce is prepared for is, is going to be key uh, to lead and to win in the transformation. But can I add, I mean, Leslie, I think something in common between IBM and GM is that because we have existed for so long, I won't use the word old, but that um, you're- <laughs> You you're, guys are like yeah, iconic. You are yeah. 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 <laughs> You're always a bridge from the past to the future. Yes. So mm -hmm. she already makes combustion engine cars, right? Like I already had clients that had huge estates of what they did. Mm -hmm. And I think what you always have to, these co companies like this have this also responsibility to be that bridge from the past to the future. And even though they're modernizing at the same time. So I, I, when Mary's talking about this, I have one of her cars, an electric car. <laughs> but what I was telling Mary, what I like so much about it is I thought that they did a masterful job. Like when I'm in it, it trans, you know, I can kind of transcend between how I run a regular car, mm -hmm. a regular, you know, a gas I car. See. It's like all the things that I see and do mm -hmm. and are make a familiarness to me to then be able to drive with the electric and all the things. So they really did a very nice, like I could sit right in a car. I didn't have to do anything. I could operate that car. And I, mm -hmm. I think you only think that way when you're part of multiple generations of something right. that you're, you know, you're not the new guy that just gets to start with from scratch. You're bridging from one to another. And that to me was an important part of the book too, to talk about that obligation to, you know, like I always felt I was a bridge from the past to the future. Mm. And you're therefore living in two worlds at the same time. And that's very different than being just a startup in one new world. Well, it also speaks to just your longevity at your respective companies too, that you had spent decades before getting that CEO job. You had seen changes, I'm sure, within those those decades before getting that job. And so being that bridge and being able to oversee a change without losing sight of the history and respect for the history would be a difficult task, but one that that you both have kind of been in that seat for. Well, and I think it's so important. Again, you know, IBM is a very large company. General Motors, we, we employ a lot of people. It's not only the, the technological change that you're driving um, and bridging, but it's making sure you bring your team along with you. Mm. Uh, you know, think about so many companies that don't successfully transform. Not only do they not exist any longer, but in what happens to their workforce? And so I feel a huge responsibility to manage the transformation well to make sure uh, and leverage the talented people that we have that are part of the company today. Mm -hmm. And you saw this last year with the labor strike mm -hmm. and yeah. kind of just going through that and well right and and valuing our workforce and and that they very they're very important. I mean I always say, you know, the our manufacturing team does a phenomenal job of safely building high quality vehicles efficiently. And that's a distinguisher for us. Mm -hmm. Um Jenny, I want to ask you, because you wrote in the book about Mary and the bonds you formed with other women CEOs. It's how we started our conversation here today as well. It's a small club. Even to this day, only about 10% of Fortune 500 companies are run by women. Um, do you think the experience of women in the pursuit of the top job is fundamentally different? And do you think the experience of being a woman as a CEO is a fundamentally different experience? Um I think I would not be telling you the truth if I said no. And it's interesting as I wrote the book, um, I, cause I spent a whole life saying, please don't look at me as a woman, mm -hmm. right? Just judge me for what it is that I do. And some of the early feedback would be, but please talk more about that, talk more about that. And so I had to think hard about it. And so I, I, it is a small group, right? So even like as a Fortune 50 CEO, there was myself and Nui, then Mary would come along. I mean, there were not many of us, mm -hmm. right, um, in that era. And I have to say something, though, as I've learned from all of these women, and this is a small group, um, but what do I think? I think, for one hand, because you are a small group, what you do does get magnified mm -hmm. and it does get personified. 
and it's just the nature of there's a small number of you of what you see there. So it is observable. It, it, it is noticeable. Um, and do you say, are you held to a different standard? Well, because what you see is noticed. I know for my whole life, I felt this way that when I was in engineering, I was the only woman in engineering back then. Mary would have been circa, I'm a little bit older, but circa same, same, same time frame. Same. And I would feel then, okay, if I raise my hand and say something, they're going to know. So I better study harder and harder. And so it was like a shield because you're afraid. Because if I say something wrong, everybody's going to remember. Mm -hmm. So it started as a shield. Then later, though, began to be a source of confidence. Because then you'd find you're in many rooms where you actually do know more than everybody in this room. And I think over time, then you learn that, you know, it's what you know is what propels you, mm -hmm. right? And so I do think, yes, I, I mean, yes, you will be noticed, remembered. Um, and I think it just made me always focus more on being sure I knew what I was doing. And I was, you know, always prepared and always, you know, some people say, oh, you're so prepared. I'd be, actually, I think preparation is a sign of respect. Mm -hmm. And it was more about, okay, because I know what I do has impact, right? So that you want to be that way and how it is, because you start to realize something I sort of walked away from for a long time was that you're a role model. You know that mm -hmm. saying, yeah. people can't be what they can't see. Mm -hmm. And and I would sort of finally realize that I was being selfish by saying, no, no, don't look at me for being a woman. Mm -hmm. Don't ever look at me for this. I then finally started to embrace it because, you know, I talk about there are different incidences that would leave a memory and a mark on me when I was presenting and a man came up to me and said, I thought he was going to ask me something brilliant about my brilliant presentation. <laughs> and he instead says, I wish my daughter was here to see this. And as one of those moments, I'm like, yeah, this isn't really about me anymore mm. at this point. I have to embrace that other people want to look at us and say they can do these jobs now. Mary and I are in some groups now to help another generation move up faster, you know, okay. and, and feel confident about that. So um, I think that is a balance and it's worth noticing. That you notice there's not many of them and that it is our jobs, I think, to help propel as many women as we can into that. And it has a lot to do with how I led, how she led, all the programs because so much of my belief of why you don't see as many women has to do with if you can't keep them in the workforce, mm -hmm. that they reach a certain point, whether it's children, family, whatever it is. And so this ability to, if they have to leave, get them back in or keep them in or the programs that allow for flexibility. And that could be men too. So everyone watching don't feel right. it's just one way or another. But that idea of getting women back into the workforce if they've left it has a lot to do with them seeing women in our positions. Yeah, it's the it's motherhood penalty, parental penalty. Um, Mary, I just want to kind of make sure that you have the same experience or if you feel the same way as Ginny does in terms of your experience working your way through corporate America and your experience as being a woman at the top. Well, I, I think it is very similar. Um, and again, you know, I had this phenomenal mother who just raised me to believe if I worked hard, I could do, do and be anything. So early on, I was, because I, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in manufacturing. So if I was the only woman in the room, I didn't really notice it. But then as I, as I got to different positions, um, and then there'd be more comments about it. Or as I, I have two, children, two grown children now, but as I, you know, I had a lot of people just assume I was not going to continue working when I you know, shared that I was going to have a child. And so went through some of those and then realized how important it was to be a role model and to be a mentor. When I got the CEO job, people would come up to me and they'd say, so you're the first CEO uh, of an auto company. Yes. You know, and then they just stare at me. And then I, I, I at first, I, I was the same as Jenny. I was kind of like, can we talk about something else? Because I'd like to think I got here because of my um, skills and abilities and contributions, not just that I'm a female. But then I had the same situation when someone came up to me after a, a, a meeting or something and said, you know, my daughter is now working hard in math and science in middle school because she wants to be like you. And then I went, okay, I get it. I get it because I had such a wonderful mother who encouraged me. I didn't, I wasn't facing the, I cannot, I can't do that because I don't see anyone who looks like me who is. And so when I realized I felt it was a responsibility and an obligation. We have one more question. I know we, we do, could, okay. Yeah, but we have one more question here on the Zoom. It's from Mark. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Amazing. Thanks, it'll be quick, I think. Uh, as seasoned leaders, I would love both of you to quick answer to the question. What's something you believed as a leader 20 years ago about which you changed your opinion as a leader at this stage of your career? You want me to go for it? Okay, uh, real fast, as Mark said. Um, I think I wish I'd been more vulnerable as a leader earlier. And I think 
for whatever set of reasons, right, where you're uh, didn't speak of personal things, didn't speak to people's head and heart at the same time, very fact driven. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it's one of those, you know, as, as I, I kind of in retrospect, right, about these principles of uh, build belief. And when you build belief for people, you have to speak to their head and their heart. And vulnerability does that. And it builds followership. So I think I probably wouldn't have done that early. And and now I, I try to encourage people to to be as vulnerable of a leader as you can be because it will build followership. I, I actually very similar. Um, I, I think the, uh, you know, I grew up in a manufacturing environment. It was a bit tough when I started in 1980, uh, working in an assembly plant and a stamping plant. And it, I, you know, so I, I was pretty controlled. And I think what I've learned over the last handful of years, especially in this role, is if you want to build that followership, you have to you have to open yourself up. You have to be vulnerable. They have to know who you really are, mm -hmm. and they have to know you care about them as people as well. Um, you know, I, there's the old saying: people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And so I think that has been something that I definitely have changed over my career. And I can, and I'm gonna, I want to end on this because Mary was gracious to invite me, but I was with her at GM and we did a little talk, but I want you to, it was bring your children to work, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, and, but, yeah. but if you would have seen how many people lined up to take pictures with Mary and they yeah. wanted their kids to meet her. No, but I think this is what she just said. It speaks to what they were honoring was how she leads. And so to that question, I think, that, that to me was, it was kind of an image of you I will always have in my mind of just, they were like just pure joy to introduce their children to Mary and to be so proud of her. And that's the kind of leader you want to aspire to be. And you are as well. I think that's the perfect bookend to our, no pun intended, <laughs> to our conversation about just the power of relationships and the power of leadership um, as you so beautifully wrote a book on. Uh, so I just want to thank you both so much for being here. This has just been, you know, my wildest dreams. You have achieved it for us um, in kind of kicking off our Leaders, Lighter, Leaders Library series. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. It's been great to be with you as well. Yeah.